you turn, you'll be on the camera there. Yeah, yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. Hello, everybody. You can say. I don't know. Maybe you later on. You can watch yourself. It will be on YouTube, as I told. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. Oh. Okay, my friends, shall we start again? Yes. I missed the point last hour and I haven't been able to regain it, so we do something else, okay? Yeah, we didn't actually finish this part. We need to um, look through how it looks here. So this is the information side. So if we return to the, the front page here, there is uh, something called lecture notes here. And if you open this one, there is uh, a whole set of lecture notes for this course. One, two, up to and including 11, which should cover these nine chapters of the textbook. So it's available for you there. Tomorrow we will start here, I think. What do you want to do? Open. Let's see if it works. Ah, seems promising. No, that was not right. What did I do now? This is the one I should, yeah. Okay, we will return to this tomorrow. So you can file all the lecture notes there. Um, there's another one here called exercises. Uh, there is some exercises here already. Maybe there will be more. We will spend some time on this. Uh, they are mainly taken from this textbook, but they are kind of copied, so you really don't need the textbook to, to do them, I think. Yeah, you see here is some. Uh, at a later point in time, there will also be solutions. Uh, I have not put out the solutions yet. Okay, so uh, I'm kind of an um, impatient guy. So if I, uh, I remember when I was a student, I, I always looked at the solutions. And you don't learn that much when you look at the solutions. So I, I have decided not to put them out before I have gone through them. Okay, so, so uh, to just for a little help for you. Okay. You can always find the solutions anyway, but uh, then you need to spend a lot of time on the internet. Maybe that's a good investment, I don't know, really. That's up to you. And here is something called added material. That's um, uh, Today we're going to talk about this one, Math Primer. And if you look at this one, you see the grade uh, distribution from the last time we gave this course. This was actually two years ago, 2012, and you see it was two A's, six B's, three C's, 1D and 2Es. Luckily, no Fs. Okay. You also see if you count the numbers here 6 plus 2 is 8, plus 3 is 11, plus 1 is 12, plus 2 is 14. So you see that we have grown a little bit since 2012. That time it was only 12 students. Now we are. Close to 30, it seems. Something around that. Okay, not bad. So that is basically uh, the structure of, uh, of this. Yeah, there's also a point called exam here, and you can have a look at the exam given in 2012. Let's have a close look at it. Uh, this is how it is. You see there is some demand curve, you know, supply curve here, and you see it should compute something here, and there is something to explain, and this is kind of how it is, okay? Today, of course, you hopefully are not able to do this. By the end of the course, the idea is that it should be easy, okay? Okay. It's a nice thing about having a Mac, okay? You don't have these updates popping up all the time. Each time I start a Windows computer, there's always some updates to install. And you know these systems, when you start to install, then everything is blocked for 10 minutes. So I stick to Mac, OK? Do we have any Ma other Macers here? Ah, one of the Finns. Yeah, that's good. OK. Uh, there is something else here. There is some uh, participants here. Maybe you are here. Arnur Askerson, that's him. 
The guy with the glass is down there, yeah. Andrea Adelinai Costa. Is that you? you? Yeah. It's how you pronounce Yeah. Noella, that's you. Yeah. yeah. From Santiago de Compostela. That's a nice place, isn't it? Yeah. I've never been there. It's a very famous city. The pilgrims are going there, aren't they? Yeah. Okay. A very classic city in Europe. Kristoff Diotka. Who's that? That's me. That's you? Yeah. You don't have a German name, Kristoff, do you? No, that's not. You're from Polish uh, heritage. No. Nah. Nah. Really? Not really? No. No. It's like you're Czech. Czech, okay. Just yeah. Oh yeah, you're from the Czech Republic. I'm sorry, I said you were German. Oh, that's no, very right. bad on me. I'm <laughs> really sorry. You see, my mind is... Uh, okay, so if you don't find your name here, contact somebody. I, the me or the administration. Uh, your name should be here, okay? Because this is your entrance to the exam. Yes, Matt? Can you scroll through that one more time? I don't know. Matt? What is your last name, Matt? Uh, three up. L U N N. And then at the top of the screen right now. Eric is here at least. From Michigan. Yeah, you found it. I don't, it doesn't really care. I can't see it. I'm, I'm, I'm blind. Okay. Uh, what did I do now? Silly, 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 silly. Now I went out of this. I must go in again. Sorry about this. Yeah, I promised you some math. Let's spend a little time on the math. And then we will finish with a little more, of the more economics in the end, okay, before we start with the actual lectures tomorrow. So then we have to go into the rooms again, uh, display all rooms, and then we find this one. And then uh, there was something in, in this category added material, and there's a math primer or PDF here. So, how do I get the full screen here? Maybe here? Yeah, uh, I really want the full screen. This is always a problem. Hmm, okay. Let me see what happens if I do this. Okay. Yeah, it works anyway. Do you know what kind of uh, system I've used to make, make this uh, false? This is not PowerPoint, okay? You know about PowerPoint, do you? Yeah. This is a different system. It's called Beamer, actually. It's uh, much nicer, in my opinion. So if you really want to ex <laughs> enhance your foil foils, please tell me. Yeah, a little math primer for stu students exposed to economic theory. So uh, what I'm doing now is I'm just running through the basics, okay? So uh, to give you an idea of what you really need to know here, okay? In the start, it should be easy, hopefully. So we start with algebra or computing letters, as it says here. Let's start with the basics, OK? If we add two letters together, A plus B, we can alternatively turn them around, can't we? Then they mean the same. A plus B is the same as B plus A. A times B equals B times A. Alternatively, sometimes we, we tend to avoid writing this multiplication sign here. So this means the same as this, doesn't it? You can just skip it. So if you, there are two letters put together in math, it means one letter times the other letter, OK? That's the kind of system we, we stick to. We must stick to that. Uh, if you look at division or subtraction, which is 3 and 4 up there, of course, then uh, if you divide uh, one number by the other and turn around, then you don't necessarily get the same answer, OK? Sometimes you get. Uh, in the case if A equals B, you get the same answer. But in, in all other cases, A divided by B is not equal to B divided by A. If you subtract a minus b, then of course you typically do not get the same if you reverse the subtraction. So this is a basic standard in math, OK? You need to remember that. If you add or multiply, then it doesn't matter if you change the order. But if you divide or subtract, then it matters. This is something you already know, isn't it? If you multiply two expressions, in this case a plus b times c plus d, then 
the result is given by a times c plus a times d plus b times c plus b times d. And you probably all, all, all of you have learned that you should start with this one, multiply with this one, that produces that one. Then you stick to this, multiply with that one, you get that one. Then you move to b, multiply and to d. Okay. Of course, you can do it the other way around if you like, but uh, it's always good, in my opinion, to kind of stick to to, to doing the same things uh, the same ways. If you multiply signs, plus times plus produces plus, minus times mi minus pr produces plus as well. If you turn around, of course, then you get minus all the time. Plus times minus, minus times plus, produces minus. Okay, This is something which uh, at least many Norwegian students seem to have problems with. Although it should have been learned in 7th or 8th grade. Yeah, I don't know. I, 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 my uh, my experience is that uh, Eastern European students are better in mathematics than Western European students. Do you think that is a good hypothesis, or is this just rubbish? Kelly, you're from Russia. You know this. It yeah. On individual yeah, it does. Yeah, but of course, if we do research, it we could always look at a great sample and say these sample uh, those are better than in that sample. What about the United States, my friends? Are you good in math? <coughs> Not me. Not you. Okay. <laughs> Matt, you're good. Yeah, yeah you're really good. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Okay. Some handy extras here. Um, a plus A is 2A, isn't it? So if you take A plus A plus A, we get 3A. A times A, we, we have a short hand notation for that. We put the 2 on top of A, so that's A square. And as you probably know, if we take A times A times A n times, we can write that as A to the power of n, can't we? Yeah. And we have these two sentences at, at the bottom here. Actually, it's three of them, which is condensed into two. I don't know the English word here. In Norway, we call them the quadratic sentences. So uh, this is uh, something which, in many cases, when you deal with, al with algebra, is uh, good to remember. Okay. So a plus b raised to the power of 2 is a squared plus 2ab plus b squared. And of course, the, the final one, I think it's called the conjugate sentence or something, is. Uh, this one, then it can be shortly written by this, a squared minus b squared. When I was at school, 50 years ago, we had to spend a lot of time dealing with these ones. I don't know about you. We spent a lot of times. Okay. Why do we need this? Now, let's look at the following simple calculation. On the top there, there's it, there is a fraction which uh, contains 2 times 3 plus 2 times 4 divided by 2. Of course, we can compute that fraction, can't we? 2 times 3 is 6, 2 times 4 is 8, so it's 6 plus 8 divided by 2. Here, 6 plus 8 is 14, 14 divided by 2 is 7. Okay, that's straightforward, isn't it? Now let's do this in an alter alternative way, okay? Suppose we put a letter to these two, okay? So we name these two A. Of course, 3 then would be A plus 1, wouldn't it? And 4 would be A plus 2. So it's A, 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 A plus 1, A plus 2, which is, is exactly what is written down here. Of course, we can compute this now, can't we? A times A is A squared. A times A is A. A times A is again is A squared. A times 2 is 2A. Of course, the a under the fraction remains. Now we can draw these together, can't we? There is 1, 2, a squared. 2, a squared. And there is 1, a there, and 2, a is there. That will be 3, a. So it's 2, a squared, plus 3, a, still divided by a. Now we can reduce this fraction, can't we? 2, a squared, plus 3, a over a, can alternatively be written out. So it's 2 a a plus 3 a over a, isn't it? And then we can factorize, can't we? So there's a common factor in these two terms. 
So this a can be put outside in a parenthesis. So it's a times 2a plus 3, isn't it? And then we can reduce this a and we end up with this answer here, isn't it? Okay. This is uh, maybe a childish example to try to tell you why we need this algebra. Okay, what's the point of introducing these letters or variables as we tend to call them when we use a nice word? It says here that the one shot calculation in the first equation cannot be repeated for other values of a, can it? Of course it can in principle, but then we have to put a different number in here each time we do it. It's obviously much easier, isn't it, to just take this result and plug in different values for a. Okay, so we can compute this for a equal to 2, then we get, get 7. If we put a equal to 1, it's 5, isn't it? If a is 2, it's 13 and so on. No, sorry, it's not 13. 2 times 2 is 4 plus, plus 3 is 7. 3 times 2 is 6 plus 3 is 9 in that case. So basically, the opening question should perhaps alternatively be why do we need formulas? Because this is a formula, isn't it? And the, the reason why we need formulas is, is straightforward. It's, it's an easy way of repeating calculations. Okay? We, we have a kind of condensed expression where it's easy to input possibly one or several unknowns to produce an answer which for some reason is interesting for us. So that's basically what we use algebra for. And when we do algebra, we substitute as many numbers as possible normally with letters or combinations of letters. Of course, it could, doesn't have to be an A here, it could be any kind of letter or combination of letters. As long as it's different for possible other combinations of letters. So this should be straightforward, shouldn't it? The problem is that when you expose students to doing these kind of stuff, they are normally able to do it if you say this is a math exercise, let's do this. Okay. But if you kind of move this into a topic, let's say economic theory or physics or biology or whatever, then it starts to get difficult. Because then you kind of need to make this link between one language, which is the language of mathematics, and the other language, which is the kind of normal language. And then you kind of have to find the link between how to represent this reality into this mathematical language. We tend to call that as for mathematical modeling. And most students, most people, in general, have problems with doing this. To kind of transpose reality into a mathematical model. Luckily, we will not do that much in this course. It will be a very small part of the course, if any. So basically, we just need to, to know how to do stuff here. And this is really not what we, we will spend most time on in this course. OK, a few words on fractions. Adding fractions needs to com construct a common denominator, doesn't it? And the certain way of doing that is just to multiply the numbers under the fraction b and d here to produce a common denominator. Okay? In that case you have to multiply a by d and c by b to produce the result. Of course it's possible to construct an easier common de de denominator. If one of the numbers is 2, the other is 4, you can don't have to use 8. And you can still use 4 be because you can multiply 2 by 2. But to be on the safe side, this works always. Okay? This does not produce the easiest common denominator, but it produces one that always will work. And if you add several fractions, you can always multiply all of these denominators together to produce this common de denominator. You multiply two fractions, the rule is straightforward. A times C on top, B times D on bottom. You divide two fractions, again a simple rule. Keep the first fraction, turn the other fraction around to produce the result. So it's A given, B given, D on top, C on bottom to produce the result. Do all of you remember these rules? Yeah, that's great. Everybody is nodding here. I'm impressed. You're not. Okay, then you have to re-remember them. Okay? Yeah. Reduction, that's what we did here, isn't it? We removed 
to simplify. Expansion is of course also allowed. You can multiply on top and bottom to produce the same answer. In some cases, that may be sensible. That's basically what we do here, isn't it? To some extent, at least. OK. Powers. We have already been into this, haven't we? We wrote it uh, there. So when you multiply more than wo one with another, you can kind of do that n times, and that in that case, you, you can write that a shorthand by a to the power of n. It says in the top here, classically, n is a natural number, meaning 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. Okay, but uh, we can kind of extend this n into being part of the so-called real numbers, opening up, for instance, for a square root. A to the power of a half is often written like this, isn't it? A to the power of a third can perhaps be written like. Is that the way of doing it? Have you seen this notation? Yeah, it doesn't really matter. The point is that this fraction here could be any number. It doesn't have to be a, a natural integer. It could be any kind of number, and it's uh, uh, there are we have calculators that can compute this for us, can't we? Ten to the power of 0 0.35 can be calculated straightforwardly forward on a normal computer. Some rules here. <coughs> and now we are kind of dealing into an area where the Norwegian students do not remember this okay, normally. Uh, in the first here it says that a to the power of m times a to the power n can be calculated by just adding the exponents together. So a to the power of n times a to the power of n is found by just adding. So we have to have the same basic number here and then we can add all different exponents together to get the result a to the power of minus n can be written like 1 over a to the power of n. And of course, given this information, we can find this one, can't we? Because now we know that a to the power of n can be written as, or actually 1 over a to the power of n can be written as a to the power of minus n. Let me take that on the board, OK? Now we will do an argument, OK? And mathematicians will call it a proof. Given that we know that a to the power of n times a to the power of n is the same as a to the power of m plus n, we know this one, and we know the other one, a to the power of minus 1, sorry, minus n equals 1 over a to the power of n. <coughs> now, if you want to find this one, actually dividing a to the power of m with a to the power of n, then we can use this one, can't we? So this can be written as 1, we can write it like this, can't we? This is the same, OK? And then we can substitute this one with this one for that one, OK? Then we get a to the power of minus n times a to the power of m. And then, of course, we can use this one, multiplying two powers, just adding the exponents. So it's a to the power of m minus n. Okay. This is a common technique in math. Okay, we make some basic definitions or assumptions, and then based on those, we can derive other results that may be of interest. So in this case, we use this definition of this meaning as well as this one to produce this one. Okay, if you raise something to a certain power. Then we can derive these formula easily, can't we? Let's see. Now we're interested in taking a certain power and raising it to another power. Of course, then we need to mean know the meaning of raising something to a power. We have already said that this means a to the power of m times a to the power of m 
times a to the power of m times 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 a to the power of m and these should then be done n times you agree okay then we can use this one again because we know how to multiply two powers we just add the exponents we do that here as well can be written as a to some power m plus m plus m n times okay and n times m plus m plus m plus m is the same as n times m isn't it so this is then a to the power of n times m which is which is the result we wanted to show okay so again we use this way of kind of utilizing definitions to produce other results we need of course this is not my invention okay. this is well known if you multiply two numbers and raise them to a common power then you can just raise each of them to this power and multiply the same by definition each of them keeping the fraction and finally we need a definition for what happens if a is raised to the zero power in that case we define it the answer as one okay still familiar stuff yeah I see some loading equations what is an equation was the question on the previous slide wasn't it yeah it says here that it's something involving x equal to zero and it says further note that the right hand side does not need to be zero it can be something else still all, all equations can be written with zero as the right hand side that, that's kind of obvious isn't it if you have this equation here we are allowed to kind of move everything freely here if we move one object to uh, the other side of the equation sign we just have to change the sign don't we so we can do that here we can keep our left hand side we can move the one to the left hand side we have to change the sign and of course what's left then is zero what we actually do here is that we subtract one from each side of the equation don't we subtract one here one minus one is zero that's what we actually do okay but as you can see any equation can be written as some expression involving unknowns with zero on the right hand side that's what we start with here okay it says here an equation or a set of equations there could be one than more than one couldn't it involves one or several expressions equated often to zero with the aim of solving it solving it means isolating the unknown that is finding a numerical or expressional answer so let's look at an equation here a real one this one for instance okay if you want to solve an equation the idea is to isolate the unknown parts x plus 2x 2x that's 3x isn't it and then isolating this part on one side so we have to move that one on the right hand side minus 3 becomes plus 3 and finally to isolate x alone to find the solution we have to divide here each side by 3 don't we? then we can reduce here and we end up with x equal to 1 okay? so that's the meaning of this okay to isolate and kind of find what we are interested in in this case the name was x it could again of course be any kind of name further on it says any equation could be freely manipulated by adding or subtracting multiplying or dividing each side with the same number or expression and we we did this here didn't we we started here by adding three on each side in that case we get rid of them and got the three over here and then we divided by three afterwards to isolate the x alone so these kind of operations can be done freely here to to produce 
our final result, the isolated version of the variable. Finally, it says we do not treat equational systems here. Okay. E equational systems is it's not really hard, but it doesn't really, we don't really need it, at least not as I can recall. Okay. The linear equation. This is something we deal a lot with in microeconomics, being able to rewrite and deal with equations, especially linear ones. So if we assume here that we look at ax plus b equal to zero, and we assume that a and b are numbers, if you like, or parameters, in a sense known, and x is the unknown, then we can solve this linear equation by using operations exactly like we did here. We start by ax plus b equal to zero, then we move the b to the right hand side, then it becomes a minus b, we divide by a and we return finally to the answer x equal to minus b over a. Okay, we start here, move that one to the right hand side, then we get the minus b, remember to change the sign, then we divide by a, vanishes here, x uh, alo uh, left alone on the left hand side, and it's uh, remaining here is minus b over a. So that is a general linear equation with parameters a and b. Of course, we can move on up here so we can make more complex equations. This is a quadratic one, a times x squared plus b times x plus c equals to zero. And you probably remember that there's a formula for this, don't you? The formula looks like this. So given these a in front of x squared, b in front of x, and c here equal to zero, the, the answer is given here. Minus b plus minus the square root of b, b squared minus 4ac divided by 2a. Okay, so that will produce the solution in general. But there are different cases here, aren't there? Depending on the sign of what is under the square root here. So if the sign under the square root here is positive, then we get two solutions. That is Demonstrate demonstrated here by this blue curve. Here is one solution, there is the other. If the term under the square root equals zero, then of course we don't get two solutions, don't we? Because then we kind of miss this plus minus. So there's only a single solution, minus b over 2a. And in that case, it means that this curve will have to hit this line exactly. There are different versions of this, isn't it? It could be like this, or like this, okay? But there is a single zero point. The third case emerges if the term under the square root is negative. In that case, you have these yellow solutions in the so-called real plane. Some of you may know that then you can introduce the so-called complex plane, which will produce solutions in that case. But in reality, it doesn't really mean anything. Okay? It's just kind of a mathematical way of making things work, so to speak. So if you, at some point in economic theory, arrive at this equation, and uh, you arrive at solutions like this, this yellow curve, then of course there must be something wrong, okay? Because uh, if you're looking for a zero point, there should be one, okay? Unless you can explain why it's not. Of course, you can look at higher powers here. You can look at cubic equations. There is actually analytic solutions for those. But if you move up to five, I think there is no analytic solutions. Okay. You probably know that the Norwegian mathematician, Niels Henrik Abel, showed that at some point in the 16th century, that uh, from the degree five and upwards, there is no analytic solutions to these equations. It doesn't mean that we can't solve them. You can always use a computer, can't we? You know Excel, don't you? You can input a formula, you can draw a graph, and you can see where this graph actually, if it goes something like this, we can always identify these points as the solutions to the equation. Of course, then we need to use a computer to help us. In this case, we still need a computer, don't we? Typically a calculator, which of course is a computer, to calculate it, unless we're lucky and are able to know square root formulas in our head. In the old days, some did, I don't. I know some, 
You know some as well, don't you? This one, you know. This one, you know. This one, you know, and so on. Okay, this is seven, isn't it? This is nine. This is two. So there are some we know. Okay, two times two, three times three, four times four, and so on. But in between there, we, we don't know these, do we? Yeah, then we have to use a calculator or a computer. But in the old days, there were some guys who actually remembered. So they knew that, for instance, that the square root of 5 uh, was something. Yeah. It's 2 point something, isn't it? Must be. OK. Yeah. Inequalities. Okay. In economic theory, inequalities are important. Sometimes we need to deal with those. OK. Inequalities can be manipulated almost like equations it says here. However, one very important exception must be observed. Watch out for negative numbers. If an inequality is multiplied or divided by a negative number, the inequality sign must be reversed. That's kind of obvious, isn't it? If you look at this example here, it starts out stating that 3 is larger than 1. And 3 is larger than 1, isn't it? Yeah, it's actually two numbers larger than 1. If you multiply on each side of this inequality by minus 1, which we do here and here, then we end up with minus 1 times 3, which is minus 3, and on the right side, minus 1, one times 1, which is minus 1. And minus 3 is smaller than minus 1, isn't it? So this sign has now been reversed, which we had to do to make the logic work. So each time you multiply or divide by a negative number, then you need to reverse the signs. This is straightforward with when it's numbers here, isn't it? But if you have a, a different sign of inequality, something like uh, Something like this, for instance, okay, as an example. Okay. You see, in order to handle this inequality, we would like to do what we do with the equations. So of course, we, what we can do here is to multiply with x on each side of this one. If we do that, then we see we can get rid of this one. Okay, that could be nice. But then we have to know, is x always positive? And if it's always positive, then there's no problem. However, if a x can be negative in some, then we have to have two different parts. Okay, so then you get kind of a, a tree here. One if x is positive, another one if x is negative. Okay, x is zero may 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 lead to problems. Okay, so this is kind of the complexity when you deal with inequalities. You typically get a kind of branching structure, as we say. It kind of produces a lot of different expressions that you need to handle. Also note, it says in the end here, the solution to an inequality is typically one or several intervals, as opposed to a single-valued solution uh, in the equation case. In an equation, you typically get x equals to 3 or x equals to 4. But in an inequality, there's typically x larger than or x less than, either one of these or both at the same time. So it's intervals instead of numbers. OK, uh, am I moving too fast? OK, this is all easy. OK, functions. What is a function? Actually, we've already talked about the function without telling. But we, we normally notate a function sli slightly different. We kind of use this f, parenthesis x, and equals to some expression. And the idea then is that by entering an x into the expression, we output a result. So a function d defines a relation between an input and an output. The output is the value of f of x. The input is the value of x. So you can think of a function as something you put into, and you get something out of it. In economics, for instance, there is a lot of these functions. We can expect, for instance, that if the interest in a certain market goes up or down, that affects something. The interest is the value of borrowing money. If that becomes more cheap, then people will buy more money. Then they typically will also buy other things from buying this money. 
For instance, they buy, may buy more flats, for instance, if the interest is low than if it's high. That is a, a link, isn't it? So then you have to construct this formula, and then you can use it to predict the effect of a change in the interest rate. So economic theory is fi filled with these functional assumptions. We assume, for instance, that uh, unemployment is uh, related to some input variables. For instance, if the gross national product is very high, then there is less employment than if it's low and so on. Okay, so these kind of relations are important in economic theory. Especially in microeconomics, we're interested in doing what is done on this left box here. Uh, and what we do there is to plot a linear function. We assume the general linear function, ax plus b, equals to f of x. And in order to plot it, uh, we can, of course, make a table, can't we? If you like, you know how to plot the function. Uh, we have uh, x here, and then we have f of x equals to ax plus b. And then we start with some values for x, don't we? Let's start with x equal to 0. Then it's a times 0, which is 0, plus b, so we end up with a b here, don't we? Then we can enter x equal to 1. Then it's a plus b, isn't it? And if x equals 2, it's 2 times a plus b, and so on, OK? But this is a kind of a cumbersome way of doing it, isn't it? If we know it's a straight line, then it's enough to, to pinpoint two points, OK? That's obvious, isn't it? If you want to draw a straight line, if you have two points, then you draw the line through these two points. That defines the straight line. And uh, the simple way of doing this is to look at two interceptions. You look at the interception with the x-axis, and you look at the interception with the f of x axis, often referred to as the y-axis, if you like. Okay. <coughs> so we can, for instance, start by computing f of x equal to 0 in order to find the intercept with the x-axis. Then, of course, we just use our knowledge of equations now, put ax equal to minus b by removing the b to the other side, and then find what we already have found here, x equals to minus b over a on the previous slide. That produces the interception with the x-axis. So this distance here is defined by minus b over a. Of course, assuming that a and b are positive number, this would be a negative number by the minus in front. So we'd expect this crossing to be on the left of origo. To find the interception with the f of x axis, it's easy to just input x equal to 0. In that case, it's a times 0 plus b, just like we did here, by the way. So then we have this distance b, and we have two points. We have one point here and one point here, and we can draw the line. <laughs> OK. When we deal with economic theory, we, we sometimes want to compare. Okay, so suppose we have a one f of x function, which is a1 times x plus b, and another one, f2 of x equals to a2 times x plus b. And let's assume now that a1, oh sorry, a1 is larger than a2, for instance. Okay, so we know that this number is larger than this one. What will the effect of that be on a figure? The expressions here are the same, aren't they? So uh, for the first one, there's a distance here which is minus b over a1, isn't it? For the other one, there's also a distance here which is minus b over a2, isn't it? Now a2 is smaller than a1, but it's under the fraction. So this is a bigger number, isn't it? Meaning that it must go further down here. So we get one crossing point there and another crossing point there. Do you agree? Yeah. Then, of course, the crossing point here is the same. It's the same b here. So we then we get something like this, don't we? We get crossing lines in this case. If we have changed that one, we would get parallel lines. Agree? Then it would be either on top here or on the bottom, depending on the values of the individual b's. 
Because if you change both A and Bs, it could be every kind of constellation here. These kind of techniques are performed a lot in microeconomics. Okay, so these we need to be able to handle. Parametric plots of linear functions, we call this. Okay. It's time for a break. Still not really finished, okay? <laughs> <laughs>